His portrait once hung on the Minnesota Wall of Fame at the St. Paul Grill before it was replaced in 2014. He's often confused with a senator who shares the same last name as he was at the 2008 Democratic National Convention. And then, there in huge letters on the screen was the name Joseph McCarthy. That's right, the former Republican senator from Wisconsin who became famous in the 1950s for his anti-communist witch hunts and died more than 50 years ago. It seems the DNC got its McCarthys mixed up. The U.S. Post Office that once bore his name is now an apartment complex and a hotel. But in late 1967, with a country at war across the globe and turmoil in the streets at home, he stood up alone and something happened. Oh, did it ever. This is his story. Say hi, Gene, and let's meet the real Senator McCarthy. Nothing divides a nation like war. By late 1967, with tens of thousands of young Americans drafted into military service each month to help fight a war in Southeast Asia, the primary recipient of protest against the war in Vietnam was President Lyndon Johnson. The issue of the war in Vietnam was more than just a little mistake made in some strange faraway uh, country. Vance Opperman was a law school student at the University of Minnesota in 1968 when he became the student leader for the McCarthy campaign. Uh, it was a generational divide. It was seen as, on the one hand, the result of corrupt, uninformed, cynical politics, which I believe it was, and on the other, by people that wanted to be involved and felt that they wanted to have some role in their own government and felt they had been excluded from that process. You could go down Pennsylvania Avenue some days and hear the chant right outside the White House fence of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? I mean, it got very, very vicious. The main thing, I think, were all the demonstrations going on outside. And uh, Johnson, I, I don't know how Johnson reacted to that. I think that he thought they must be from uh, not just uh, unworldly, but from some other planet. For too long, the political system has been a political system of bosses and of parties and of leadership. I mean, that great phrase, you know, union leader and this kind of leader and that kind of leader. You know, the people just don't dig their leaders. The theory that the way to go to end the war was to uh, build opposition to Lyndon Johnson within the Democratic Party and that such opposition was possible because you could stand in any street corner and talk to your person on the left and the person on the right and whether they had different positions on the war in Vietnam, they both hated Lyndon Johnson. We were so uh, angry with, with uh, Johnson and, and he was against Johnson and that's all we needed. I still remember you know, saying to somebody, you know, my dog, I don't think I even had a dog at the time, was running. Or maybe somebody else said it, and you know, we would support him. Anti-war leaders Al Lowenstein and Curtis Gans started the Dump Johnson movement and separately began seeking a Democratic candidate to challenge fellow Democrat, President Johnson, in his bid for re-election. U.S. Senators Robert Kennedy and George McGovern, among others, were all approached. They all said no. He didn't want to be seen just as running against Lyndon Johnson as a, some sort of vendetta. Um, he wanted to be seen as really stating out a position about the war in Vietnam and what needed to be done there. So Lowenstein and Gans considered another option, Senator Eugene McCarthy from Minnesota. McCarthy hailed from the same state as Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey. And uh, along the way, at one point, I think we probably had uh, 15 or 20 senators who had made some kind of challenging commitment against the war in 66 and 67. I've been reading uh, uh, about your concern on the uh, bombing. I understand the basis of your uh, concern and doubt and perhaps fear. So it became clear to me that the Senate was not going to, in any kind of effective way, challenge the war in Vietnam. The only thing left to do was really to make it an issue in the campaign. The fact that no one else would do it didn't, to my mind, say, if no one does it, I don't have to do it. 
In fact, if no one does it, you have to do it. On November 30th, 1967, Senator Eugene McCarthy announced he would challenge President Johnson in primaries in Wisconsin, Nebraska, Oregon, and California. McCarthy later made a decision that would forever change the course of the 1968 presidential campaign. Actually, the people in New Hampshire uh, asked us to come in, and, uh, and the troops were getting restless. You know, sometimes you got an army, you got to let them go, even though they shouldn't go. And uh, so we were persuaded to go to New Hampshire. They had legions of young people, but they were called clean for Gene because they had pigtails, they had scruffy beards, they had beads, and if you were going to go out and campaign for Senator McCarthy and knock on doors and say, let me tell you why you should, you should back this senator from Minnesota, <laughs> the thought was you ought to clean yourself up. And so the name stuck, clean for Gene, the young kids. When he announced for the presidency in November 30th, 1967, it was the same day that my wife and I had our first child, James. Writer and pacifist Coleman McCarthy, no relation to the senator, later was a longtime columnist for the Washington Post. I wrote a letter to Gene McCarthy and said, what a great day for the McCarthys. You announced for the presidency and my wife and I had our firstborn. So it was a great day for the Klan all around. Each year, runners take to the streets of Manchester, New Hampshire for the Shamrock Shuffle. But once every four years, folks from across the country converge on the Granite State, with a population of just more than 1.3 million, for a different type of race, the battle for President of the United States. Starting in late 1967, New Hampshire residents experienced something they had never before seen. I think the young people, because that was um, really the first time they had been used in that way, um, provided an enormous and refreshing focus to the campaign. But it wasn't only that. Curtis Gans, who was a civil rights organizer of 1960 lunch counter sit-ins in North Carolina, was 30 years old when he joined the McCarthy campaign as a voter organizer in New Hampshire. And what was unique was, you know, citizens rallied, you know, to save their country. What was u unique, you know, was, you know, that you had, a, I think at that time, a pretty good marriage of man and movement, because I think Gene McCarthy for the state of New Hampshire was a pretty ideal candidate. The most amazing thing is, this was a widespread grassroots effort to seize control of a policy, the policy in this case of foreign intervention, that had previously not been uh, seized by the grassroots. It had always been imposed by, uh, from, from on top. I found that the students were genuinely concerned about the substance of Vietnam, but also concerned about political processes, and there were demonstrations, as you know, and talked about uh, non-politics and of no votes and demonstrations, and uh, that uh, I sensed that most of them really wanted to do something more or less within the system if they were given a chance. The candidates themselves, Johnson and McCarthy, though both Democrats, could not have been more dissimilar. There was this cleanness that in addition Purity. to everything else that Johnson never had. I mean, there were, I just remember him picking up his dog by his ears and showing us his, his appendix and all those other kinds of things. And so, you know, people personalize politics a whole bunch. And so um, Eugene McCarthy was able to frame a different narrative about how things could be. You know, to understand this fully, you have to realize that uh, Gene uh, is what uh, experts in Irish history call peat bog Irish. It means the Irishman that sits there staring into a peat bog and thinking very deep thoughts. George Reedy was previously a press secretary for President Johnson before returning to the White House to help with the re-election campaign. To Johnson, Johnson had a very keen intellect from the standpoint of a superb brain, but he didn't understand intellectuality for the sake of intellectuality. To him, an idea meant something you did something with. To Gene McCarthy, an idea meant something that illuminated the world for him. 
Sam Kaplan was 14 years old when he first campaigned door-to-door for one of McCarthy's congressional campaigns. And the fact that Gene McCarthy wanted to do this in his uh, elegant way was very appealing. Mary McCarthy, one of the senator's daughters, took a leave of absence from Radcliffe to work on the campaign. She not only influenced her father's decision to challenge President Johnson, but was also largely responsible for recruiting student volunteers to work on the campaign. They said we were amateurs, and they said we were disorganized, but on the ward level, I don't think New Hampshire had ever seen anything that organized. They'd never had a door-to-door canvas, and I think it was very effective. Students came in droves to work for McCarthy in various states. In New Hampshire alone, as many as 2,000 college students took time off from school to work full-time for McCarthy. Another estimated 5,000 volunteered on weekends. We would lecture them and we'd say, you're you're here to oppose the war, right? And they'd say, right. Uh, But people in New Hampshire support the war, right? Right. Therefore, you know, we don't talk about the war except perhaps in terms of its endless quality. What we talk about is honesty and integrity. Some of the people might feel um, a little bit offended that uh, their town is being invaded by college students, but we can turn it right around. We've come all the way out here because we believe so strongly in Senator McCarthy and want to help him. They were the first generation of activists in modern times of young people in politics. In my generation, in the early 50s, (laughs) <laughs> we drank beer, <laughs> we you know, crammed for exams. Was, politics was something that was out there, but it was not something that we spent a lot of time on. Eugene Joseph McCarthy was born March 29, 1916, in the central Minnesota town of Watkins, where he attended St. Anthony Catholic School. McCarthy later enrolled at St. John's Prep High School in Collegeville, Minnesota, and then St. John's University next door. While at St. John's, he excelled in the classroom, earning him the nickname the Watkins Wonder. He also played semi-pro baseball during the summers and hockey for St. John's in the winters. Following graduation in 1935, McCarthy at age 19 taught in high schools in Minnesota and North Dakota before eventually returning to teach at St. John's. His upbringing and time at St. John's, including nine months he spent as a Benedictine novice considering the priesthood, solidified a faith and moral background that would later shape his politics. In the words of historian Dominic Sandbrook, his Catholicism was the single most important thing about him. Uh, When Jerry Brown uh, was running for president the first time, I remember seeing a uh, interview by a reporter who was really going to stick it to Jerry Brown, who was in the seminary quite a while. I mean, he was much longer than Senator McCarthy was. Father John Malone grew up in McCarthy's congressional district on the east side of St. Paul and was a newly ordained priest when he backed McCarthy's run for president. The interviewer said, well, don't you think that your religious training and religious background is going to impact and affect your decisions. And Brown looked at him just like, well, I hope so. And I think the same thing was true of uh, uh, Senator McCarthy. I find it a little odd that someone would think that uh, some early experiences wouldn't be influential. Jerry Brown, son of legendary California Governor Pat Brown, and himself a four-term governor of the Golden State, was actively involved in McCarthy's campaign in California. Obviously, if you're you know, in a seminary or maybe the child of someone in the mafia or someone who's uh, a football player or maybe someone who's a great hunter or somebody who's a soldier, that is going to shape uh, the context in which the child sees the world or the young man or young woman sees the world. In 1946, now married to Abigail Quigley, McCarthy moved to St. Paul, Minnesota and became a professor of sociology at the College of St. Thomas. In 1948, political opportunity greeted McCarthy, who ran for the United States Congress from the 4th District of Minnesota. His campaign, I've heard the stories about it from colleagues at St. Thomas, was run out of a mimeograph machine in the basement of one of the uh, 
uh, academic buildings at St. Thomas. Probably a violation of every law possible. And they probably never paid for the paper either. In the House, he was popular and competent. Something of a rising star, wrote one historian, who then added, his Senate career was really a disappointment. The McCarthy campaign continued to gather steam in preparation for Election Day in New Hampshire. But one of the biggest boons to the campaign occurred thousands of miles across the globe. On January 31st, 1968, North Vietnamese troops launched an all-out attack on U.S. forces in South Vietnam. It became known as the Tet Offensive. And when the Tet Offensive actually broke, oh Lord, it, uh, you know, it just shattered almost everything. One week prior to the election in New Hampshire, voters in McCarthy's home state of Minnesota prepared to meet in caucuses. In both states, the get-out-the-vote efforts remained intense. I remember a man chasing me down the hallway of, a, of an apartment building over on Stevens Avenue uh, because he was incensed. He was a long, strong Humphrey supporter and uh, couldn't imagine long-haired hippies, as we were always called. We were always long-haired hippie uh, communists, usually. And sometimes there were aspersions as to one's uh, sexual orientation thrown in there for good measure. This is Tony Randall. How will you feel? Just stop and think for a moment. How would you feel if you woke up Wednesday morning and found that Eugene McCarthy had won the New Hampshire primary? Wouldn't you feel that suddenly there was new hope for America? March 12, 1968. Voters went to the polls in New Hampshire. Even on Election Day, despite a strong surge by the McCarthy campaign, President Johnson was still the odds-on favorite to win big. The press said we'd get 12% in New Hampshire. We knew that was wrong. Elmer Davis, an old newspaper man at the time, said if there are only two people contesting in any American political contest, anybody can get 20 percent. So we said, well, we'll get twice as much as the press said we did. And in New Hampshire, you don't have to win, you just have to beat the spread. In the end, McCarthy astounded everyone by getting 42 percent of the vote. President Johnson won with 49.5 percent. But when the write-in votes from the Republican ballots were counted, the senior senator from Minnesota came within a mere 524 votes of defeating the incumbent president of the United States. Now the next morning, the attention clearly turned to Senator Kennedy. He'd said he wasn't gonna run. But our desk in New York, the ABC News desk, found out that he was coming back to Washington that morning aboard an American Airlines plane. And I was dispatched as a correspondent in the Washington Bureau to go out to the National Airport and uh, see if I could talk to him. Sam Donaldson, who later earned fame for his coverage of the White House, was a young reporter for ABC News in Washington, D.C. The crew set up. And to my surprise, we were the only ones there. I mean, not just the only broadcast reporters there or television people there, but there weren't any other reporters there. Kennedy got off the plane. And I approached him and said, Senator, to speak to you a moment, he, he paused for a moment. And I said, in light of what happened in New Hampshire yesterday, are you going to reconsider your decision not to run for the presidency? He said, yes, <laughs> I'm reconsidering it, or words to that effect. Wisconsin, America's Dairyland, the birthplace of the Progressive Party, and the site of the second presidential primary in 1968. In Wisconsin, like other states, women played a pivotal role for the McCarthy campaign. Many of these women had never previously been politically active on their own. I was speaking at a group in Massachusetts during the campaign. This man who owned a lot of chain stores came up and he said to me, does your husband know that you're talking about issues? And I said, Yes, he sent me here to talk about them. He said, I can't believe that. I'd never let my wife do that. Uh, a man may have some patriotic motives for wanting his son to go out and fight. There aren't many women that do. I think that that was where you had the real beginning of women as a separate block of voters. And most of us hadn't caught on yet to how deep that was and how serious it was and how it was changing the whole face of American politics. 
The third floor of the McCarthy House in Washington became the Women for McCarthy headquarters. Well, I started in Washington and worked in the McCarthy attic. Where the, in, in the attic of the McCarthy residence is where the, you know, volunteer activities were initiated for the whole campaign. When? Early in January? Yeah. Who was with you at that time? Mrs. McCarthy was there, um, and a lot of her friends, and a lot of the kids that are still involved now. We kept getting little dribs and drabs of money, and we'd buy more stamps and more postage and more stationery. The candidate's wife was a force of her own, who earned the respect of campaign staffers. And she even had a fan in the Oval Office. Gene, how are you? Pretty good. Glad to hear you. Is that wife still living with you? Yeah, she's with me. Well, she's a very understanding, tolerant woman. I've always had great, uh, great uh, respect for her and great understanding and sympathy for her. I just have to live around a guy like you very long. Well, is it, is it growing? <laughs> <laughs> Despite momentum on the campaign trail, not everyone was convinced Senator McCarthy was the best candidate to defeat President Johnson. McCarthy's campaign style and sometimes acerbic personality drew criticism from even some of his supporters. We used to think when we were working hard down in the basement of a building or when we were working in the campaign office, we used to imagine McCarthy and Jerry Ellers, or his administrative assistant, sitting up in the room with their feet up. Jerry Eller once said of McCarthy that I never knew a, a man who demanded so much total loyalty and gave so little in return. He was a very clever and proud man who didn't suffer fools gladly, explained historian Dominic Sandbrook. And there's a serious doubt about whether he really wanted to win, to become the nominee and then president. Well, I said, I said I didn't want to, but I was willing, which is a much stronger commitment than wanting the presidency. Gene McCarthy wasn't, you know, 12 events in one day and glad handing. Uh, Gene McCarthy was, you know, three or four events in one day. With McCarthy's lead in Wisconsin growing, along with the probability of Bobby Kennedy entering the race for president, a secret meeting involving Kennedy's younger brother, Senator Ted Kennedy, took place in the early morning hours of March 16th at the Hotel Northland in Green Bay. So I proposed, and, you know, you know, first to Blair Clark, and then, you know, secondly to Lowenstein, who was, you know, doing things for Kennedy, uh, that it might be useful to explore the possibility of, so long as Lyndon Johnson was in the race, dividing up the ensuing states in a manner that would, at least until California, leave only one opponent to Lyndon Johnson in each one of the subsequent states. When they first came, somebody called and said, the senator from Massachusetts is at this hotel. And this was, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning or something. And I said, well, the senator from Minnesota is at this hotel. So eventually, the senator from Massachusetts came to the senator from Minnesota's suite. Somewhere in the process, either Blair Clark's information was wrong or Gene McCarthy had turned against the idea because we were greeted with CBS cameras at the hotel in David Shoemaker, and McCarthy had gone to bed, and Abigail was outraged. And when he came in, he was full of charm and good humor and saying it's soon to be St. Patrick's Day and if the Irish are divided they unite on St. Patrick's Day. And I said in Minnesota it's Sven Skarnestad, Senator Kennedy, because I thought that was such a blatant, insincere statement. Senator Ted Kennedy recalled the meeting during a 2005 oral history project with the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. McCarthy was basically tired, non-interested, disdainful, remembered Kennedy. He was on a big high. It had all moved for him. He was pretty much in the catbird seat, wondering why in the world he was being disturbed. Senator Kennedy's statement that I had killed the agreement, uh, it was a great surprise to me because I was never sure what the agreement was or what the meeting was really about. Ted Kennedy said he delivered a message that his brother might not enter the race if Senator McCarthy agreed to focus more on urban issues. 
There is yet another theory on what was discussed. Well, I just know uh, from talking to people who were there and from McCarthy and Teddy himself uh, that uh, he uh, had broached the possibility of, Ke of Teddy being his running mate and uh, Teddy turned it down, said he was not, was, did not want to run. Say what? He uh, had broached the possibility of, Ke of Teddy being his running mate and uh, Teddy turned it down, said he was not, was, did not want to run. And uh, I don't know what they could have expected to come out of it, because uh, I, I uh, we'd had experience with Bobby and we'd had some experience with him about the district, uh, that uh, we weren't prepared to make any concession because we didn't trust him. Later that morning, Robert Kennedy officially announced his candidacy for president. I remember that day very well. It was, we all, the family piled into the car, um, and we went to the Senate caucus room, which is now the, called the Kennedy caucus room. It was very, very exciting and um, a little confusing because uh, it was not a, it wasn't a campaign like the 1960 campaign where John Kennedy had planned to run for years in advance. Uh, the vast majority of people who were giving up their time who did not have a long-term political agenda and who were active uh, in the anti-war movement, but now had become uh, very committed to McCarthy, were angry. Uh, and frankly, I was too. Uh, Kennedy had had the opportunity to jump in in September and October and November and December and January, uh, but it would have taken real courage. Certainly have gone out to recruit students in a way which I didn't do, we didn't have to do, because as I said, they came to me and, and evidently after his announcement, they, they were not overrun with applications, people who wanted to participate. On March 29th, with the Wisconsin primary only a few days away, LBJ advisor George Reedy delivered a message to his boss. I remember I finally wrote a memo to Johnson, which I was trying to be optimistic, but at the same time, bring him face to face with reality, in which I said he could get renominated and could get reelected. But he had to do certain things. Two days later, on the night of March 31st, President Johnson addressed the nation from the Oval Office. Vance Opperman gathered with other McCarthy supporters in Minnesota to watch the speech. And there were people in, the, in, in our crowd that thought that Johnson was going to announce some dramatic change in our Vietnam policy, that, that Humphrey, those were the people that felt that Humphrey was opposed to the war, and that he would work on Johnson and he would be able to persuade Johnson to change the policy. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. As the war wore on and, and as the result of the opposition to his policies continued, he looked sadder and sadder and his earlobe seemed to get longer and his face seemed to get more creased. I was the anchor for the ABC radio coverage of another presidential speech on Vietnam. It seemed like more of the same. I have lived daily and nightly with the cost of this war. I know the pain that it has inflicted. And in fact, we had an advanced text of President Johnson's speech, or at least most of it. And I was listening to it, making a note or two, trying to decide what I wanted to say when it was over, when he shocked the world. Remember, I was in a restaurant at the time, Chinese restaurant, I knew the proprietor very well. He set up a television set so I could watch. Johnson has been scheduled to make a speech that night. Halfway through, I said to my wife, he's going to quit. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Immediately, almost, he ended, and I had to think of something to say, and I could, I, mean, I was flabbergasted. Here was a man who had used political power all of his adult life who was the power broker par excellence when he was Senate Majority Leader. And as president, had it pushed through such tremendous pieces of legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, Medicare of 65, his so-called Great Society, he was behind it. And the thought that Linda Johnson would give it all up voluntarily. And now the political world was turned upside down. 
I don't know whether my memo had anything to do with it or not. So I never had a real conversation with him after that. We were overjoyed. It meant that our little efforts, and I, we were taking more credit, of course, than we were probably entitled, but it meant that our, our little efforts uh, were nothing more than the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, and that Johnson, at least, understood more than we did the depth of opposition to his policies in Vietnam. Senator McCarthy's wife, Abigail, placed a call to President Johnson shortly after his announcement. The minute um, he came on the phone, I realized that, that I was a little bit mistaken about his attitude because there was a certain uh, sort of the Machiavellian side of Lyndon Johnson reflected in his answer and in his voice. Well, I just thought we had to do it because there's so much at stake that one little person uh, like me didn't. You know you are one little person. <laughs> well, I've got nine months now to do nothing except to, I won't spend one moment doing anything except trying to find peace. And, Teddy, my uncle Teddy once told a story about Lyndon Johnson in the war. There, there was an election in Texas for a small town of about 10,000 people. And Lyndon Johnson wanted somebody to win the election as mayor. And they lost. He said, if I can't get my candidate elected in Texas, how can I possibly get what I want in Vietnam half a world away. With Bobby Kennedy in the race, the tone of the campaign changed as Kennedy focused on civil rights issues to connect with voters in areas of Indiana, the site of Kennedy's first head-to-head -head battle with McCarthy. So he understood that there was a challenge, but when he became Attorney General, he could see that the how really horrendous it was to um, be African American in, in this country that you you know you couldn't where you couldn't go to the bathroom easily you couldn't sit at the lunch counter um, you couldn't trust the police to protect your rights. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, Kennedy's eldest daughter, traveled with her dad on one of his campaign trips to Indiana. He was able to listen with empathy to the difficulties um, they faced. And uh, over time, they realized that. Um, and so they became uh, much more, um, they understood that they had uh, a friend in, in my father. Never was Kennedy's connection with the black community more evident than on the evening of April 4th. I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed but he was killed by a white man. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. While civil rights issues played well with voters in Indiana, where Kennedy won, the same could not be said about Oregon. Here, the demographics favored McCarthy. Kennedy people were kind of upset. One of the reports we got that they couldn't find a ghetto in Oregon, which they were in, in, intent on. About all there was was kind of a rundown area down near the harbor in Portland for the old seamen, but they, they couldn't find a ghetto, and they were supposedly unhappy. It was, it was a huge defeat. It was the first time as, that a Kennedy had been defeated in a primary. You know, my, father, my uncle, T uh, John Kennedy, had won every primary he had run in in 1960, and um, so it was very, very tough. 
And so it made the California primary even more important. But it was a real battle, and it was, it was to me, it was the, the best battle of the year. And of course, I was really glad to win. I can remember having debates with people. I can remember saying to people, well, I had said about Bobby Kennedy, I said, well, I said, you know, you have to remember that he was um, Joe McCarthy's staff, and uh, they didn't like that at all. And they said, well, he was young then, and he didn't know better. And I said, he was 27. I said, my kids at 17 would know better than to do that. And uh, I learned not to say that. Well, we've had a lot of retrogrades. I'm sorry to say we had Joe McCarthy, alcoholic, sad story, that brought disgrace to the Klan. So I always thought that Gene brought the name back into civil discourse. The Klan is there. And Gene, I, I think, brought back some positive acclaim to, our, uh, to overcome the damage done by Joe. With wins in the Indiana and Nebraska primaries, Kennedy held a two-to-one lead in head-to-head -head contest with McCarthy. California offered a battle with drama worthy of Hollywood. Two candidates, both of Irish descent, both Catholic, both, though one more than the other, opposed to the war in Vietnam, yet each distinctly different, and neither particularly fond of the other. Being on a campaign trail with him, um, at that time was really like being mobbed. He was a rock star and people wanted to touch him and they're screaming and yelling and there's just ex enormous excitement about being with my father and that's really what I remember being on a campaign trail with him. McCarthy's campaign had its own star-studded cast. No star was more prominent on the campaign trail than legendary actor Paul Newman. I mean, who in this, in this world, in this day, could ever think that uh, a man could really come out and merely stay with the issues, doesn't care whether you, you know, about image making, sat up there alone by himself when all the other guys were hiding out and running around. I mean, that's the nature of leadership, isn't it? To know and to get in there early. Newman, who enlisted in the U.S. Navy after high school and served in the Pacific during World War II, shared McCarthy's anti-Vietnam War sentiments. And so I asked the officer, I said, how do you feel about the fact that a guy like me comes up to campaign against this war when you've lost a son in it? And he said, uh, well, he said, I got another boy and I'm not going to lose him. The, the anti-Vietnam crowd was for him, no question about it. But the passion that often is associated with a successful politician was not really there. They were against the war, and so they praised McCarthy. But the speeches he gave were often cerebral. And that's very good, but emotion is what really sells on the stump. While Kennedy connected with the migrant farm workers of California and other minorities throughout the state, McCarthy continued to display a chameleonic persona. It could be mean gene, he could be clean gene, he could be congenial gene. He was very good at putting down people when they uh, uh, subtly and not so subtly sometimes. <laughs> and he didn't hesitate to criticize people or fellow politicians and other individuals. I remember he said about um, Romney, when Romney went to Vietnam and came back, he said he was brainwashed. Uh, Gene McCarthy once said, well, he didn't need a brainwash. A good rinse would have done it. Uh, so he had a way of, of saying things that uh, were, was very striking and unusual. And nobody since then have, has come close, in my opinion. Well, you know, some people have made a, a, dis a distinction that uh, Democratic primaries have always been divided between the A students and the B students. And Gene McCarthy had the A students and my father had the B students. Um, and that's been a division in Democratic primaries since 1968. What remained constant for McCarthy was his opposition to U.S. involvement in the war in Vietnam and the government power structure that facilitated it. So certainly being in a pre-Vatican II seminary, which he was in and I was in, where Latin was spoken. Catholicism under Pius XII, which is what 
what he grew up under uh, was a more uh, study, a more the, the framework was was more rigid, uh, traditional. So the, the, he was not a utopian. Um, I think his kind of measured Catholic uh, liberalism it gave him a sense of, of balance. So he's very interested in the process. Didn't like the way uh, Lyndon Johnson personalized things. Um, wanted a more restrained uh, way of government. Uh, so the, 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 that's why some of the more, some conservative people I think liked him because he had a, uh, an understanding of what government did and what it shouldn't do. I remember him saying at one point, what bothered him was the change that had come over the Pentagon. Uh, and I remember asking him, uh, well, what, what do you mean uh, change that, that had come over the Pentagon? And he said, well, you know, whenever he used to go over to the Pentagon as a senator, they always spoke English. But in the last couple years, since they'd gotten involved in Vietnam, they all, like the Pope, spoke Latin. And he was afraid that they believed in the doctrine of infallibility. Someone said the, the problem you have with the military is somewhat the same as what you have in religious vocations. If you have the call and what you're called upon to do doesn't really answer that, then you start to be what you would have been if you hadn't answered the vocation. Well, I think this is what's happened in the Defense Department. So many of the military are beginning to be what they would have been if they weren't officers. On June 1st, McCarthy and Kennedy met for a debate in the studios of KGO Television in the San Francisco Bay Area. One night when I was covering McCarthy during the Indiana campaign, I think it was April, uh, something happened that caused me to say to him, well, Senator, uh, would you debate Robert Kennedy? And would you do it on ABC? And McCarthy said, yes, I'll debate him. I'll do it on ABC. And I called ABC's officials and said, guess what? And they put together the debate. And so it occurred on ABC in California. Instead of preparing for the debate, McCarthy spent the day with poet Robert Lowell. Tom Finney, who you know, at that point was running the campaign in California, had gotten Gene pumped up about the debate and uh, Robert Lowell had deflated. At one point in the debate, Kennedy promised a large shipment of U.S. fighter jets to Israel. Years later, McCarthy said he considered Kennedy's suggestion a way to pander to Jewish voters. But during the debate, McCarthy said nothing. Bobby Kennedy made it real clear uh, of his back end of Israel in a way that was more traditionally political. And Gene McCarthy didn't like to go along with the obvious. He didn't like to do what was expected. He was a little, it was more standoffish. And I think the uh, uh, exuberance of the political uh, gave him pause. And I think he identified that with excess, excess in Vietnam, uh, excess in, in the federal government. Kennedy made race an issue too. After McCarthy said he thought there was a need for public housing in suburbs, as well as inner cities, Kennedy accused McCarthy of wanting to move 10,000 blacks from the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles to Orange County. McCarthy did not aggressively dispute that allegation during the debate. Kennedy always had the, the black voters convinced that I'd been against civil rights. And I had a perfect doctorate on civil rights going back to 48, you know. But this was a switch in the emphasis on the campaign. That television debate um, sharply uh, distinguished uh, Kennedy from McCarthy, and McCarthy didn't come over as quite the, the um, you know, the, the, what shall I say, the, the speaking in, at the level of, of intensity that some of the constituent groups would find congenial. If I could put it, it almost as a McCarthy way of explaining that. Because it was that close, and had he scored a home run in that debate, Gene McCarthy would have won that primary you know, over Robert Kennedy. Shortly after midnight on June 5th, Kennedy declared victory during a rally at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. He was shot minutes later and died the following day. The slim hopes McCarthy had for becoming his party's nominee were dashed even before delegates arrived in Chicago in August for the Democratic National Convention. Vice President Hubert Humphrey officially joined the race for president on April 27th, but because of timing, 
did not enter a single primary. Instead, he worked to secure support of political bosses and delegates throughout the country. Well, I said, I think it was at Penn State that I felt like a runner in the Penn Relay, that every time I went around the track, they put another runner in against me. But I started out running against Lyndon, and he was through, and then we had to run against Bobby, and we anticipated, and we did finally, the intervention of the assassination, we had to run against Humphrey and the party. So that um, when we sort of finished, got to the convention, not meaning to do it, we'd antagonized practically ever every identifiable block in the Democratic Party. McCarthy had hoped to secure the backing of Bobby Kennedy's supporters after California, even though at the convention, South Dakota Senator George McGovern sought the nomination as Kennedy's would-be successor. Uh, that could have been a natural allegiance that they all would have come over to him, and he was disappointed in that. It didn't happen. People's emotions were very high at that time, and and when you believe very deeply in a cause, which is, that was a cause campaign, uh, it's not easy to reconcile uh, with others when you really believe that you're doing something for the right, you know, for a higher purpose, for a higher reason. It's much harder to say, oh, well, let's, okay, let's bury our differences. The convention was marred by backroom dealings, while in the streets, Police clashed with protesters, many of whom were McCarthy supporters. And the kids from McCarthy took to the streets and the police fired tear gas at them and <laughs> those of us reporters who covered it, I was tear gassed uh, along with everybody else at one point, uh, and the riot occurred and it was just terrible. Humphrey's stock and trade was open politics and fair selection of delegates and, and uh, one person, one vote. But uh, when it got to the showdown at the convention, why he didn't stand by those principles. He was, you know, give me as many delegates as you can. The delegates were not able to come out strongly against Vietnam, even though I think a lot of them felt that they should. Of every political party, when it's holding a convention, knows that it cannot repudiate a president it has that's still in office. What was left of the political bosses preferred uh, Humphrey to anybody else? There are controlling structures, and those controlling structures shape what happens. And if you get too far outside those, it doesn't happen for you. Humphrey left Chicago with his party's nomination, and his supporters waited for McCarthy to endorse his fellow Minnesotan for president. And they waited, and waited. But after the convention, Gene McCarthy, to me in character, was very bitter, maybe he had a right to be, uh, and instead of embracing Hubert Humphrey, his old friend from Minnesota, uh, just was silent. Well, we often socialized with Gene, our family, and was very kind to my boys and my wife. And we had, I think, a six-year-old son named John. And Johnny loved baseball. And uh, he met Gene at a, at a dinner one time. And John heard all of Gene's stories about how he played first base for the team, and he, and he got these many hits one year. So Johnny said to him, why did you stop playing baseball and, and go become just a senator? Why did you think that way? In October, McCarthy was part of a meeting at Bob Short's Lemington Hotel in downtown Minneapolis, where Humphrey watched election night returns one month later. Vance Opperman was at the meeting, during which McCarthy was asked again to support Humphrey. And McCarthy said, well, he would do that, but before he did that, he had a very important assignment he had to finish. He couldn't tell us what it was. Very important that he finish it, and that he was working on it right then, and he'd be done with this very important assignment, which would be published in just a week or so, and that as soon as that important assignment was over, it was so important he had to do that first, then he would announce his support 
for Vice President Humphrey. Well, we speculated that he had opened up negotiations with uh, North Vietnam or that there was some uh, new initiative about joint elections or perhaps the United Nations or some dramatic development in the Vietnam War that the senator couldn't tell us about. Instead, uh, he had been hired by Life magazine to write a series on the World Series. And it was only after he finished his series on the World Series that he then turned him, uh, his attention to what he obviously regarded as a lesser task. And he did it not by making a speech, not by throwing his arms around Humphrey, you know, sort of a traditional thing. He sent over a three paragraph press release to the news galleries uh, uh, in the Senate. I was there when it arrived. And I don't remember the exact words, but it said in effect, okay, uh, let's get behind Senator Humphrey uh, he's the best uh, of the candidates for the presidency, or nothing glowing, nothing huge. Would that have made a difference? Who knows? Even today, many Humphrey supporters are still angry, some even bitter, blaming McCarthy's delayed and tepid backing of Humphrey for the latter's loss to Richard Nixon. But Humphrey did not break publicly with President Johnson's policy on Vietnam until September 30th when during a televised speech from Salt Lake City, Utah, the vice president suggested a ceasefire and said if elected president, he would halt the U.S. bombing of North Vietnam. If he came out against Johnson and then turned around to support his buddy, unless his buddy in Minnesota had, um, had changed his policy, then what about all the thousands of young people who had followed him over the cliff practically believing that he meant something different. None of it was enough. On election day, Republican Richard Nixon was elected the 37th president of the United States. Even though he did not get his party's nomination for president, Senator Eugene McCarthy secured his unique spot in American history. The president of the United States was obviously lying to us. The American public knew it, they figured it out, and they found out a way to get rid of him. And that's an important lesson for a democratic society to learn. And it's an important lesson for people who are in their 20s to learn. The thing that he provided for us was a, a legitimate electoral channel for change, which is what democracy is supposed to be about, which does not come easily. I think they should remember him as somebody who altered the course of history in a very significant way. He was not intended to be President of the United States, but in an articulate and elegant way, he offered an alternative to a President who was so unpopular because of the war in Vietnam. It brought all the students, many of the students who had given up on the political process, back into the political process. Uh, I think that was the greatest gift of the campaign, really. We've forgotten how divided people were and how the students were literally in the streets before Jean gave them the opportunity to do this politically. You know, I think McCarthy of 1968 um, uh, should be looked upon as a patriot. You know, you know, as somebody you know, who came you know, in the time of national crisis to the nation's rescue you know, and you know, salvaged a portion of his country and a portion of his party, you know, in the most eloquent way possible. It helped Johnson abdicate. It helped open the way to other Democrats. It helped legitimize the protests of the war in the streets of the country, legitimize the young people and women and others who came to protest the war. They weren't just a flock of uh, people who uh, weren't thinking straight. They became what America was against the Vietnam War. The singular success remains that normal, average, ordinary people had an impact, a pervasive and ultimately successful impact on a major policy mistake that this country had made. That I think is an important lesson and I think that's what history will recount as the most successful part of the McCarthy movement. A photo of Eugene McCarthy returned to the Minnesota Wall of Fame at the St. Paul Grill 
in 2015, where many individuals are honored for their popularity and charisma. Yet a select few, like Lindbergh, Brooks, and McCarthy himself, rose to a moment in time to each accomplish something that forever impacted America and the rest of the world. And that is his enduring story, the legacy of Gene, the real Senator McCarthy.